Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I come from the Amazon, uh, from Brazil, and I have a very simple message. We have to face the challenge of a huge revolution in our lifestyles. And to illustrate this, I'll start with an image um, of planet Earth. This is hour by hour, day by day. What you see in white is water vapor. In yellowish is storms. This is sort of where uh, we are in the Amazon. And this is sort of where we are here in Africa. We're all connected. We are in a single world in which life is dependent on nature. And unless we value this relationship, we will not have a very nice future, unfortunately. So that is the biggest challenge that we have. And Africa and South America have all been connected in ancient times, in geological times. We, especially in Brazil, have a very strong connection with Africa. The largest African city outside of Africa is Salvador in Bahia. We praise African goddess. I am a son of Oshala. We praise Yamanja, Oshun, Oshos, Ogun. All these African uh, symbols are very present in Brazil. So we have a lot to share. And I think we also should be looking at a, a change in relationships between countries. Africa has received a lot of influence from Europe, a lot of aid that was not very successful. I think we're in a time where we should look for more South-South exchanges, more lessons learned from places like Latin America that are applicable to, to Africa. Uh, and the point that I want to make on ecosystem services in, in the case of, of Brazil is illustrated by this diagram. Water vapor comes from the ocean. The Amazon forest, which is here, plays a very important role. And this humidity goes to southern South America. And if it was not for the Amazon, we would not have rain in the way we have. And if we had not the rain, we would not have electricity, because 70% of our electricity is dependent on, on rainfall. Agricultural production, the same. And supply of water to cities in all types is also dependent on the Amazon. So in the case of Brazil, it's very clear. And I'm sure that in the case of Kenya, in the case of the Congo Basin, also forests play a very important role. And it's this role that we have undervalued historically. Uh, people who live in the middle of the forest are providers of services. And people in urban areas are recipient of these services. But oftentimes, they don't pay for this. They get a free ride on these services being provided by forests and forest peoples. We have an illusion that we, with modern life, have the control of everything. With uh, remote control, cell phones, air conditioning, we have this illusion that we can control everything independent of nature. But that's not correct. We are very dependent on nature. And the bad news is that we're not taking good care of it. The lakes, the rivers, the oceans are all being badly treated. The good news is that there are many cases where solutions are being developed and implemented successfully. The challenge that we have is to get those solutions, to identify them, to see the lessons learned, and multiply them and scale them up. In the case of forests, we have to look not only at the tons of carbon or the liters of water or uh, the goods that they produce. We have to look at people. The fate of forests will depend on how people who live in the forest look at those forest resources. And the decisions on what to do with the forests should be taken 
there where people are and by the people who live there. And that's a revolution in decision making and in power relations because usually decisions are taken in the capital, in cities, affecting people in the forest. And very rarely it's the way around. And that's part of the solution that we need to uh, increase and scale up. And there are many success stories in places like the Amazon, in other parts of Latin America, and also in Africa, uh, that need to be looked upon and scaled up. We have these little fish uh, in the Amazon. Uh, that's called the pirarucu. Uh, it's about 120 kilograms, that particular one that you see in there. And the message is we can harvest those fish sustainably. And that's the good part of this story, that there is a lot of science that uh, allows us to do sustainable management. The same goes for timber. A lot of timber that we use in the roofs of our houses, in the chairs that we sit, in the tables where we eat, is unsustainable. Actually, most timber consumed in Latin America and in Africa is not sustainably produced. But it can be produced sustainably. There are ways of doing that. Women are often and most of the times in a place of disadvantage. And there are many solutions to increase income and jewelry coming out of old crafts is one of, uh, of the many ways that we can deal with this. Chocolate, which most people like. I particularly love chocolate. Uh, do you all love chocolate? <laughs> yes. But chocolate can be uh, produced and marketed in a fair way or in an unfair way. And we should look for labels that tell us that that particular piece of chocolate is coming from, from a, a fair trade system. What does that mean? That the guy who is collecting uh, the fruit is being well paid. Uh, it's not being exploited by the middleman. Solutions are by nature very diversified. Uh, solutions for the Amazon may depend on boat transportation, which is not the case in many other parts of the world. So we, we have to be very creative. That's a beautiful part of the challenge that we have ahead of us. We have to uh, foster and sponsor and, and, and help uh, the explosion of creativity so that we come up with a lot of local solutions. This revolution that I'm talking about is one that is not going to come out of a top-down approach, but rather it's one that has to be a result of consciousness, of awareness. And awareness is linked to education. Let's look at the case of Korea, which was a poor country at the end of the Second World War. It made a revolution. And what was the most important lesson learned? Education, education, and education. This is a new school that was built in one of the 572 communities where we work. Uh, there is a lot to be done, not only in building schools, but rather in using different methods. Radio communication is a way of empowering people and also a way of getting the message across. Different types of, of education facilities so that people learn what is relevant to them. Oftentimes people study details of cell biology, details of chemistry, which are not relevant. Today you can find that information in, in a cell phone, Google. Uh, and people should learn how to manage their fish, how to manage their timber, how to do a business plan, how to count for their carbon, how to count for the water that their forests produce. So it's very important to have relevant education. And that's where I think we should focus our, our attention on. Uh, and this has to do with field education as well as with all the modern tools of education. Uh, building structure that professors go to the middle of the forest but, uh, and, and not only stay in, uh, in urban areas. These images show a little bit of what is possible to be done. 
uh, there's still a lot more that needs to be done in the Amazon and, and in, in most of the developed world and in areas where we have uh, um, forests. Um, we have to campaign in urban areas for uh, better awareness. This is a campaign we did in urban areas in Brazil. Uh, and to say this is an old trunk and this is a drawing on, on the footpath. It says that everybody likes the shade of a tree when it's warm, but very few people take care of the trees. So we're all taking a, a free ride on this uh, service provided by, by the tree, but we're not taking care of that tree. And that applies not only to the trees, but also to nature as a whole. So I'd like to invite you to see how you yourself, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your country, how well you're treating nature. And how could you do differently? Uh, I'm sure there are many ways that small changes in your lifestyle could make a difference. And if we all do this, this is going to be the revolution or the beginning of the revolution that uh, we need. The bad news is that we don't have a lot of time. This is the latest report of IPCC, the Climate Change Panel, that tells us a very simple message. We're running out of time. Uh, the planet has passed some boundaries. The Arctic is going to lose all its ice. It's just a question of when, if it's 2020 or more or less. Uh, so we have to act urgently. And that's not a message said by an environmentalist who has a radical view, but rather is a message that coming from science. So we have to make a huge change. And it's not just planting a tree across the street, but it's rather making a huge revolution in the way we produce goods, in the way we buy stuff, in the way we relate to our uh, development. Again, the image that we're all connected. Um, whatever is done here in, in Africa affects us in the Amazon. Whatever we do in the Amazon, you see the clouds here, they go all to Sierra Gorda in Mexico and affects rainfall there. So we're all connected. So there's another sense of globalization that we need to be more aware of that we live in the same planet. So we have to have more solidarity. That's why I'm a strong advocate of South-South cooperation. Instead of having North giving advice to the South, let's have the North financing the South to exchange lessons uh, among the developing countries. I think that's the solution. And one of the beautiful things which is happening today in, in Nairobi is a focus on South-South cooperation. And I think the South-South cooperation is one of the keys to make this revolution in different parts of the world. I'd like to come to a close uh, with two thoughts. One is by an Argentinian uh, cartoon called Mafalda. And here she looks at uh, the first slide at the globe and sort of preoccupied. And in the second one, she taps like this the globe and says, well, don't worry, because in this very moment, there are thousands of people studying all your problems. Overpopulation, arms race, pollution, all of the problems. And then he, she walks away as if she was satisfied. But then she turns back here and says, yes, I know. There are more problemologists than solutionologists. What can we do? I think there are too many people looking at why things don't work. Too many people saying, well, this is, has a problem. But very few people getting to work, going to the field, to the mud, try getting the mosquitoes and facing the banzeiros, as we call in the Amazon, the waves of the rivers that sometimes sink boats. So we need to act. So we have to get the best brains, not to write about the problems, but we have to get the best brains to come up with solutions. And not only come up with a 
theoretical solution, but get that theoretical solution in practice and see if it works. Because oftentimes, what seems to be a solution does not work. So we have to test it, make sure that it, it is evaluated, and if it's not successful, revise it and improve it. But we have to get to practice. I think one problem that we have today is that too many people do workshops, coffee breaks, reports, PowerPoints, and all of this, but very few people go to the field. It's actually more comfortable, right, to sit in an air conditioning room with a PowerPoint and discuss and agree and disagree. It's much harder to go to the villages and, and face the hard test of failure, because sometimes it doesn't work. You plant something and it dies, and you have to figure out why it died and why you, could do, you have to do differently so that it, that little plant survives and becomes a, a nice fruit tree. Uh, so it's very important to, to uh, place an emphasis on solutions, and that's what I'd, I would like to invite you to do, to become a solutionologist. And finally, uh, I think we have to come up with a, with a nicer uh, and closer relation to Mother Nature. I think nature provides us many services that science can count for. Carbon, water, biodiversity, all these things that science uh, has told us that it's important and essential to us. But there's another thing which is essential. I think it's uh, the spiritual value of Mother Nature. It's the way that nature helps us fine-tune with our inner soul, with our inner uh, God, whatever your religion or your spiritual uh, beliefs are. It's essential that we make that connection back. Let's not fall into the trap that because we have uh, remote controls, cell phones, and air conditioning, we can live without nature. We cannot. We have to connect more. And the good news is that the more we are connected, the happier we are. Nature is a source of happiness. It's a source of love. And I think this is the drive that we have to go, in a way, backwards, recover the roots, recover uh, our connection with Mother Nature. Thank you so much. <laughs>